Right, so we'll make a start, um, and I, maybe people will come in a bit later, but that's all right. Um, I've been, I was thinking about what I'm going to sh talk about, what I'm going to show you, um, and really in the amount of time I've got, uh, I'm not going to try and do too much. I'm going to try and keep it quite uh, sort of detailed about what I'm doing. So I'm, I, I've already made a piece, as you can see, um, a slab built part. Uh, I'm going to do some mono printing because that's a technique that I use quite a lot. So I'm going to demonstrate how I do that. I'm going to demonstrate one or two other things on this piece of work about how I make surfaces. Then I'm planning to do a, a little bit of a, a PowerPoint presentation about um, things that I look at, influences, things that I'm interested in, things that inspire my work. Uh, but we'll see how the, the demonstration might take a bit longer than I, 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 than expected. I'll see how it goes. So um, I thought I would talk about surface really because that's something that I'm particularly interested in. It's not that forms are not important. Forms are also very important. And how the two work together for me is is very important. So I want to avoid making um, pots that have got sort of paintings on. The two have to work together. The, the form and the, the piece have to work well together. So I'm going to demonstrate some mono printing on here. Um, and it's a technique that I use because I quite like to question about like how, how, how I apply materials onto the surface. It's quite an obvious thing to do, to get a brush and paint onto the surface. But there's, there's other ways of applying materials and mono printing I found to be quite an interesting way. And it's the, the technique involves uh, painting some of the on that I'm using. So what, so I'm going to, this is uh, one of the materials that I typically use. It's, it's the on that I'm painting with. It's, on is a bit like a slip. Um, except it's not quite as dry as a slip. So it's really, if you imagine a slip with, a, with um, a, something in it that makes it flux a little bit and melt a little bit. I'm going to paint this onto a bit of newsprint, um, fairly, fairly thickly, as you can see I'm doing there on the screen. Um, and then this, this is going to uh, dry a little bit and then I'm going to use that. I'm going to put that onto the side of the pot and then I'm going to, uh, the, the, the slip is going to transfer, the on is going to transfer onto there. Um, but so that I'm not using uh, printing with like a white colour onto a fairly white clay, I'm going to paint a little bit of um, earthenware slip onto this patch that I'm going to work on. <coughs> Actually, I'm doing, I'm doing this the wrong way around. I'm going to print onto this slab of clay here. So I'm going to paint um, a bit of, this is just red earthenware slip, quite thin, right. and this is just going to be a background for the, for the mono printing. Sorry. And I think I'll just uh, dry that off a little bit. There's quite a lot, with all ceramic processes, there's sort of uh, waiting in between while things dry but this is I find this is very good for speeding the process up so I just want this slip to dry a little bit before I work onto the top of it It depends on it, everything depends on the weather really um, you know it when when the when it's good weather making ceramics and make the process is so, so much more fluent um, in, in colder weather wetter weather it can be slowed down and that's when having artificial way of drying things is really good um, but that's that's no, that's okay that's just going to be tacky now now um, I painted the slip onto there and I need this I need this on go to be um, the right dryness it's a stoneware clay. It's earth stone hand building material that I use, um, which is quite a nice white surface, a little bit gritty and quite a nice white base to work on. So I'm going to I'm going to transfer this onto here, but I'm going to draw into this first. I'm going to start making some marks at, at this stage, on, on which will eventually be on the surface of the pot. Um, I haven't I haven't it, it necessarily planned exactly what I'm going to. I'm going to draw on here, but by drawing, I'm, just, I'm using a pencil, not because I'm leaving a pencil line, but it's the, the point of the pencil is actually just going to remove some of the, uh, some of the ongo from the paper. 
uh, I'm going to have something that's suggestive of lettering without literally being lettering. And where I've removed the on globe, um, we're going to uh, see through those parts and then we're going to be able to see the red clay underneath. So I'm going to then take this and put it on top of that wash of red okay. earthenware. And this is going to come off the newspaper, hopefully, and stick to the clay. Um, a tool that I use, to, to, so I need to apply a little bit of pressure to the back of this now. And I, I've got this um, knife that I've used, and I tend to use it over and over again. And it's kind of worn out, just quite into, uh, probably not the, the one I haven't brought with me, but one of these will do. Um, so I'm going to apply a little bit of pressure on the back of this. Um, and because it's just newsprint, it is a, obviously quite a fragile material. So I, I will need to be careful not to rip it. And the nice thing about this technique is that it do, it's not um, perfect. You know, some of the, the on-go will transfer, some of it might not. So it'll leave um, sort of like a bit of an imperfect surface. Uh, I do need to go over this a few times just to make sure enough of it is going to transfer. Um, and, and I'm going to, before I reveal it to you, I'm going to paint. <laughs> but uh, yeah, this is this is what it should look like when it comes off. So I'm going to I'll lift this up and show you in a minute what it's going to look like. But yeah, so you can see the ongob has now come off the newspaper, and it's um, stuck onto here. Uh, and those are the those are the, some of the initial marks that I'm going to apply to the surface of the pot. Then. And I, I, I brought this as well just to show you the the sort of <coughs> possibilities with this technique because I, I do um, I send out a, a, a Mailchimp email to my mailing list and um, I did it in November this year. So I wanted a heading for the um, the, the, the the email. So I so I did a, some these these mono prints. Um, and I did, I did a few and it just sort of helps, it sort of illustrates the, the different possibilities of using just that one technique to, to apply it in different ways so you can create quite different results with it. So uh, that, I, I, it was just in the studio and I was just going to recycle it but I thought as I'm demonstrating this here, it'd be quite good to bring that with me. So I'm going to go back to the pot now and I'm going to, um, I'm going to cut a section out of here which I've just roughly marked with a pencil, but I'm going to remove a bit of the pot um, by just cutting into it with a scalpel. And then I'm going to fit a bit of that clay back into the section that I've, remo that I've removed. So I'm taking this bit out. And this has come from... I want my pieces to look like they're slab built. They're, they're slab built, and I want a sort of them to look like that um, and I like it when you can see the joins and I like it where you can see overlaps and edges and um, the piece that I'm going to put back in is not going to be exactly the same size as this so I'm going to cut a section from that little piece that I've mono printed but I'm going to make it a little bit taller so it's going to be so it's not going to follow this it's going to follow this and then it's going to up a step and then carry on <coughs> So I want it to be about maybe about a centimetre taller. So I'm just going to estimate the size of that. Now I've cut most of those edges, but the edge that's going to form the rim, I don't like to cut it all the way through because it leaves a very sharp, hard edge cut line. So instead, I've just scored it. And then if I, if I break... If I break that off, then it, it leaves it more of a sort of torn edge, which is a little bit softer, which I prefer, rather than a really sort of cut edge with a scalpel. And this is the piece that I'm then going to fit back in to here. So it should fit, because essentially I've used the other bit as a template, but it is going to be, as you can see, slightly taller. 
And then I can demonstrate a little bit of how I uh, join things together because I'm going to fix that piece back in. It's a little, I think it's a little bit too tall on this side. So I'll just remove that bit. So to join the clay, pretty standard stuff. Um, I've got a favourite fork that I use. Um, I'm sure this fork, it used to be longer and it, <laughs> <laughs> it's done, it's, it must have, I, I don't know how, how much area of clay it's scored over the years, but it's, it must be quite a big area by now. And uh, I know that uh, people have different ways of slab building and joining clay together, but, um, you know, and I know there's no right way or wrong way. You know, some people would just put slip on it and just push it together, but I prefer to make sure it's really put quite well, you know, properly scored. So I go over it, um, I'll put it up here again. So I, I go over it a few times. And then um, the slip I use, I think, is quite important. The slip I, I use to join, um, I, I don't like it to be too thick. I want it to be fairly watery. The idea being that it should be fluid, fluid enough that it runs into the score marks that I've made without leaving little air pockets. Because if it's too thick, it, can, it kind of just sits on the top. So I want it to actually flow into the, the, the grooves that are made with a fork. Now I have to just um, line it up where I want it to go. And equally as important as the scoring and the slip is then adding some pressure to it as well to sort of really sort of push it together. Um, and you need you need quite um, agile fingers, hands to do this. But you need I want to try and sort of get grip it and then just push it together and wriggle it back and forward a little bit. So that, and there should be enough slip on there that it actually oozes out from the join. And again, that then it's it's another one of those things that um, demonstrate th there's going to be evidence left of how it's been made. I don't want to clean that up too much. I don't want to um, sponge that off. I want to sort of leave that little little line of slip because that's part of the making process. And I had in mind, when I make a piece of work, I, I normally have in mind what I'm generally trying to do as I'm with the, with the surface. But in this piece, I sort of, I, I have, I, I've planned it a little bit. Um, and it's a, it's a sort of um, a composition I've used before, but I want to paint this sort of quite big cross shape on the surface. So if I turn it this way around, you can see it on the screen. So, and I do find like drawing things out with a pencil is quite useful. Um, a soft pencil because it'll leave uh, temporary marks on the surface. And um, they, if I decide that the marks aren't quite in the right position, then I can change it around. But it just gives me an idea of where where things might go and the composition. And that's something that I think that I, I think is really important in my work is the arrangement of different elements together within within the piece of work. It's where you put one shape compared to another that's quite important. So um, I'm going to then use a, a bit more colour. Um, I've got some, the, the, the way that I add colour is uh, I've got this white on go that I use for pretty standard. I use quite a lot of that. And then I'll add um, a stain to it to make different colours. So this is going to be a sort of pink colour. And it, it, I can see that it's just about pink. When, when you're looking at this, it looks like it's not much different from that, but it is, it's got a slight pink tinge to it. But in, in my head, I know what that's going to be like when it's fired. Um, and I'm just going to paint, I want to sort of emphasize that, that sort of cross shape that I've put on there um, by painting one, the cross one color and the, 
the, the, the sort of corner is a different colour. I'm just wondering which way around to do it. I think I'm going to make this bit, this bit's going to be pink. <clears throat> and this is where it becomes, you know, it is like making a painting, I suppose. Um, and, you know, literally like brushing it on as if it was paint. But as I've talked to a lot of people about this weekend, it's the I, I treat my work as paintings, but they're they're different from that because they are three dimensional, and I like the way that marks go around a form, uh, and I think that's really important. To, uh, paintings are always very flat for me. I always there's a little bit of a frustration about working just on a two D surface compared to working on a three D surface and thinking about how marks go around something. And that's, that's only going to be a background colour. I want to build up layers. So, so that, that pink isn't going to be too visible in the end piece of work, but it's just going to be there subtly in the background. I'm going to build up layers on top of that. I don't think I'm going to be able to demonstrate the other layers because that really would need to dry and then I'd work on top of it. But the corners I'm going to make, I'm going to use this much uh, darker slip. And um, so I'm, I'm using ongobes but I'm also using slip as well. So I've used a red earthenware clay slip, and this is um, a black clay. They say it's, it's called black. It's actually a sort of really dark brown, but it's a really nice, rich surface. Um, and it's a pretty good color at the moment as well. Uh, so I'm gonna use this to sort of contrast that part of it. I'm gonna use this to uh, fill in the, the, the corners. And I don't want to do this too precisely. I want to leave brush marks. I want the two colours to mix together. Um, this colour and the pink that I already put on. Yeah, I use oxides and body stains. So it, it, a piece of work for me is quite a mixed media approach, all ceramic materials, but quite a variety of different ceramic materials. I'm just going to um, use a little bit of water as well, because I think using these on goes in different um, consistencies is interesting as well. So. It's, uh, I generally use it when it's quite thick, but if it's watered down, it's more likely to drip and run, and I quite like that effect as well. So if I deliberately wet this, And then I would put this on. I'll, I'll try and turn it so you can see the screen again. So when I put this on, I want it to run like that. And because I've wet the pot, it sort of encourages this to run down. I don't want to overdo it, but uh, it's. This is this is the ongobe. Yes, this is the pink the pink ongobe, the same colour that I've put on there. Um, and I, you can, I can control that a little bit by then, if I decide that those marks are a bit too, you know, there's too many of them or a bit, a bit too clear, then, then they can be sort of dulled down by adding a little bit more water to it so that they just fade a little bit, so that the material becomes thinner. Of course, by doing that, you're making it very wet. And then there's a, then so this piece would then be left to dry a little bit more. But there's um, another material that I use is are um, these um, underglaze uh, velvet. What are they called? Velvet underglazes. <laughs> um, but I like these because they're really quite vivid colours compared to everything else that I've used. They're really quite bright, vivid colours. So I was thinking again when I was thinking about the composition. I know I like to have a sort of um, parts that are a little bit more prominent. So and the, these colours are good are good for that because they they're a bit brighter. So this is going to be a little focal point of green. All 
around here. And this, the, the, as I say, this will be painted over. So I, if I was going to carry on with this piece, I'd then, I'd then sort of wait, wait for this to dry and then brush over the top with probably the white and then maybe, maybe another color on top of that. But, uh, the, but I, I want to have some sort of focus just at that point there, which I know is difficult to see on the screen, but if I turn it around, you can see it. And it's a, I, I think the pink and the green are, uh, contrast quite nicely. Um, another way of making marks is directly making marks directly into the surface. So that little focal point, I'm not, it's not just going to be color. It's going to be marks incised into the surface as well. And I, again, I find the simplest tools are, are often the most useful. Um, I'll show you some of the some of the things I use most often. It's just, I have this old uh, wooden ruler, and I, I just cut it up into bits. And um, and these these little points can be formed into different shapes. So uh, you know it's not a good ad advert for for pot clays and all their posh modelling tools. You know things like this are much better. And actually, just a blunt pencil I find I use quite a lot just to make marks into the surface. Um, I, I can't I can't do this left-handed. So I'm, if I'm like that, yep. So I'm just going to make some sort of repeat marks in on top of that green splodge that I put on there. I quite like. I'm going to when I do my. Uh, presentation I'll, I'll show you some of the things that I like looking at and where I get ideas from but I quite like um, things that have got sort of repetitious marks and um, sort of man-made patterns within natural landscapes and I like I like marks like this where it's got a bit of a grid it's got a bit of a structure to it um, so I think I'm going to leave this piece like that for now um, and then I'll um, I'll talk I'll do my PowerPoint presentation and then perhaps when if this is dry then I'll come back to it and I'll show you how I carry on working on the top of it and um, but that, that's that's really just the, sort of the base layers ready for more uh, to go on when it is a bit drier this is going to be 5 to 1140 degrees oh, yeah. and that that's the temperature that I typically fire to okay. yes uh -huh. Yeah, and most of the material that I put on is done at this stage before it's fired. So uh, I'd wait for this to go a little bit more leather hard. I would add more layers to it. Um, and w when I'm satisfied that, it's, that I've put enough on there, then it gets fired. Uh, when it comes out of the firing, I add bits of glaze, uh, bits of oxide, uh, and maybe a little bit more on go. But most of it's put on at this, this stage when it's leather hard. Um, I do I do the first firing to 11.20 and then the second firing to 11.40. Um, I quite like, I don't want it to be a, a low fire bisque temperature because I find the clay is too absorbent and when you're glazing it, it sort of, it, it goes, the glaze just goes on too thick. So it's, when it's fired to 11.40, it's not quite as absorbent and it, it, for me it just goes on a bit better. But often they can be fired, they're always fired twice, but they can be fired uh, more more than that because I might get it out of the kiln and decide that I want to add a bit more color uh, maybe even paint a bit out sometimes I've started grinding bits off because if they're fired on there and I decide I don't want them I can get a grinder a dremel tool and I can grind little bits away which isn't a terribly nice process grinding a, away at the surface it's a bit like being a dent like a crude dentist um but um but it's quite handy to it's always it's almost like rubbing out isn't it it's like it's like erasing something and then working on top of it again but that in a sense can add a richness the more layers you build up um can add a richness to the surface okay so if i uh, leave that for now